My name is Todd. Uh, I am one of the pastors here, and uh, I have the privilege of closing out our series today on Jesus' high priestly prayer. We've been taking a look at this over the last three weeks, and we enter the final section of Jesus' prayer. And I think if Jesus found some things that were important enough to pray about, that we probably should pay attention to them, right? Right? And so over the last three weeks, we've, we've looked at this prayer, and we've looked at the things that Jesus felt necessary to bring before his Father. And this is right before Jesus would have been taken away and arrested and then ultimately crucified, right? So these are, these are some of the very last recorded prayers, at least, that we know of Jesus. This is a section in uh, the Gospel of John that's called the Final Discourse and the High Priestly Prayer. And so it's kind of the final things that Jesus is teaching his disciples and the final things that he is lifting before his Father before he goes back into heaven. And so in the first section of the prayer, Mel uh, covered for us a couple of weeks ago how that Jesus opens his prayer by praying that about the fact that he knows that he's going to be taken back into heaven. He's going to be reunited, right, as if he were ever separated, but he's going to be take him back into glory and sit at the right hand of the Father. And so he's praying that the Father would restore him to his former glory. And and essentially he's asking the Father to help him to endure the trial that he knows is coming. And then after he prays about that really pressing, immediate thing, he turns his attention to those who are immediately around him, and he begins to pray for his 12 disciples. And he prays that his disciples might be unified, and that they might be one with him and the Father, and they might be one even in the same way that he and the Father are one. And then we get to this third section of the prayer, and Jesus changes his focus yet again. And so we'll pick up reading in uh, John chapter 17, verse number 20, and we'll read through the end of the chapter together. It says this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus that it is quick and sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces the hearts. Your word says that it it even cuts between the bone and the marrow. God, what that means is that it goes to the deepest places of where we are and who we are. And you expose, God, our deepest need for you. And so I pray, Lord, that you would do that today, that your word would pierce our hearts. God, that we, would, that we would grow even more to understand just how desperate our need for you. And Lord, that we would learn to trust in you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. So as I said, this is week number three, and we get to this section of Jesus' prayer, and Jesus changes his attention once more, right? And it's kind of like uh, the, the scope of his prayer continues to expand outward. He starts praying uh, for himself and for the things that he's about to face, and then he prays for his disciples that are immediately around him, and then he broadens the scope of his prayer even more, and he begins to pray for, uh, as it says in verse number 20, all those who will believe through their word. So he's referring back to the disciples, and he says, I don't pray for just these, but for all those who will believe in me because of their word. And so Jesus, as he begins this final section of the prayer, turns his attention to the future. He turns his attention to us. I think it is amazing to know that Jesus prays and prayed for us. 
I, I hope that you take comfort in that. I hope that you are in strengthened and encouraged by that, to know that Jesus has not left us alone, that God has not left us without help, and that He is not mindful of us, that even when Jesus was walking on this earth in physical form, He prays and considers and looks forward to the day when you and I would believe in His name. That's amazing. And so we can take confidence in that today and take comfort in that today. And so he begins to, to focus on the future and begins to focus on all who will believe in his name because of the testimony of the disciples. And he begins to pray for us much in the same way that he prayed for his disciples. And he begins by saying this in verse number 21, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And he begins to pray around this idea of unity, of oneness, and what D.A. Carson describes as a mutual abiding. And so as we begin to unpack this a little bit this morning, Pastor Mel touched just briefly last week on the idea of unity. I want to begin to unpack that just a little bit more, and I want to talk about what it means for us to live in this mutual abiding, what it means for Christ to abide in us and for us to abide in Him. Because when we talk about unity, we usually just uh, what our mind automatically goes to is this idea of, well, if we could just all get on the same page. And it's not that that's not uh, important, and it's not that that's not part of what consists of unity, but I think if we simply look at it in that way, like, you know, some, sometimes even trivial things like we think, well, if we could all just agree on what color the carpet should be, that's unity. Um, and we, we kind of stop short of, of what Jesus is calling us to. And I think that if we can understand what Jesus is talking about and what Jesus is really getting at when he talks about unity, then the other things will take care of themselves. The disagreements and divisions and things that sometimes pop up. And by the way, uh, just real quickly, unity is not 100% agreement. Did you know that? Some of you didn't, apparently. Yeah, we, we, can, we can have unity in purpose and disagree about the best way to get there. That doesn't mean we disfellowship or dis, you know, break off. And, and so those are important things, but that's not at all really, I say at all, that's not the heart of what Jesus is getting at here. And so I want to look at, again, what it means for us to have Christ abiding in us and us to abide in Christ. What it means really for us to live in unity with God. Because if we can do that, then these other things will, will fall into place. God will see to that. The Holy Spirit, the Word of God says, His job is to lead us into all truth. Right? And so if we are walking in lockstep with God, if we are walking in unity with God, then what we will find is that there begins to be much more agreement among us as well. Amen? Man, you guys are quiet. I know I'm normally, uh, you know, maybe a little more loud, but you can still be loud. It's okay. So here, just as he prayed for his disciples, he prays for us to be one. And he has this kind of circular language, right? He says, just as I am in you and you are in me, so they may be in us. And, he, he, and this is a this is a language that's familiar in John's gospel. If you read the gospel of John, this is a kind of language that John uh, uses over and over. In fact, if you go back just a couple of chapters to John chapter 15, uh, there's this language that Jesus uses where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you'll bear much fruit. And so this is a language that Jesus' followers would have been familiar with. And these are pictures that Jesus has painted for them before, this understanding of what it means to live life 
uh, in unity, and live life in relationship, live life in oneness with God. And he paints this picture of a vine and a branch, and he talks about how that the branch cannot be separated from the vine and, and maintain life. That they are integral to one another. That they are integrated things. And, and that if you separate the branch from the vine, it will no longer bear fruit. But he says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, and again, this is language from Jesus' prayer in, in chapter 17 as well. As my Father has loved me, so I have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Let me, let me pause real quickly here because I think sometimes we, when we read this, we get the idea that, well, if I will keep all the commandments, then God will love me. That is not what this verse says at all. Right? What it says is that if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. It, it doesn't mean that if we don't keep the commandments, God stops loving us. It means that, that when, we, when we fail to keep the commandments, that we, we don't live in it. We don't experience it in the way that God has designed for us to. We don't rest in it. And so Jesus is saying that if you want to rest in my love, if you want to abide in, if you want to live in, if you want to experience it in its fullness, if you keep the commands, that's the, the byproduct of that. He's not saying, I don't love you if you don't keep my commands. He's saying, I want you to experience life and life to the fullest. I want you to know what it means to live in and know and rest in my love. I want you to know what it means to be completely satisfied in me and the path to that that I have laid out for you is the law it's the commands it is the instruction that I have given you can I tell you that the, the the law of God the instructions the commands of God are never intended for us to gain righteousness or earn something they are never intended to feel weighty or heavy they are instructions for us to live in the best possible way to experience freedom and life and liberty and, and power. But we don't often believe that. We believe that God gives us these commands so that we might not experience life. But if He is a good Father as we sang about a few minutes ago. What do good fathers do? This is not at all where I went for the other two services, by the way. So, but I, really, I feel like this is where the Lord's leading us, so come along. I set rules for my daughters. Precisely because I love them. If you're a parent, you understand that. You don't, you don't tell a child not to touch a hot iron because you don't want them to experience the joy of touching a hot iron. <laughs> right? You're, you're not trying to, to limit their life experience. You're trying to steer them toward the best possible life experience that they can have. You tracking with me? This is what a good father does. And so when the Lord lays out instruction for us, when He, when he says, do this and don't do this, 
It is because He understands what is best for us. And as a good father, He wants us to experience the best possible life that we can have. And so, so man, if, if we fall into this trap of thinking that, that God is, you know, that the, the Scripture says I can't do this stuff because, you know, because God's a cosmic killjoy or, you know, then, then we've fundamentally misunderstood the character of God. He loves you desperately and deeply today. And his desire for you is always good. His heart for you is always good. That is why Jesus prayed for us. And in fact, uh, the scripture tells us that he continually, even now, is praying for us. The word of God says that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for us. So Jesus prays for our unity and he's praying first and foremost that we might be one with him. That we might, we might know his heart. You see, Jesus is praying that we would be in relationship with him in the same way in which he is in relationship with the Father. That we would be so intimately and closely tied to Him that life would flow out of Him as the vine and into us as the branches and our very essence would be drawn from who He is. So that when people see us, they would see Jesus, just as Jesus was able to say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And there, there's some things that happen, there's kind of some outcomes of this. The first is joy, contentment completeness, wholeness. Uh, in, in going back to John chapter 15, when Jesus is talking about being the vine and the branches, he says, these things I have spoken to you, this is in verse number 11, these things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Church, whenever we find ourselves wrestling with discontentment or envy or anger or strife, whenever we find ourselves struggling and failing over and over again with the same sins, with the same issues, whenever we find ourselves failing and falling flat on our face and making a mess of things, whenever we find ourselves uh, overly uh, anxious or stressed, every time without fail, I know in my life and I believe that it is true for you, I, if I look back at those moments in my life, it stems from my failure to abide in Jesus. Every time. Because when I am not abiding in Jesus, when I am not resting in who He is, when I am not trusting in His sufficiency to be all that I need, that is when I get my eyes on other things and other little G gods that will always fail you. When we fail to stop and recognize our full dependence on God and His full sufficiency for us, it breeds discontentment in our hearts and it erodes our joy. But Jesus invites us into, indeed He prayed for us that we might enter into this mutual indwelling that gives joy its completion. The second thing that happens when we abide in Christ in the way that Jesus prays for us to is this. At the, at the end of verse number 21, he says, So that the world may believe that you have sent me. When we abide in Christ, when we draw our life from him, the world notices that is when people come to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. We are the evidence that Jesus is real. If we want the people around us to come to faith in Christ, if we want them to experience joy and life to the fullest, then we need to be living out of joy, right? We need to be living life to its fullest. And it doesn't come from 
a, 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 really, a really slick presentation, right? I mean, we, we always get this idea that, man, if I can just get people to come to church, and it's not that, I mean, people raise their hands almost every week here to receive Christ. We are blessed beyond measure. It's amazing what God is doing here. But it is not the slick message, right? Slick, this, this was slick in any way, right? Uh, but it's, it's not a really well-presented message or uh, a, a, you know, a perfect uh, worship set where no wrong notes are played. Or It's not any of those things that bring people to faith in Christ. It's the evidence that they see in us. It's when they see people like you and me who have all of the same issues and problems and we, we face the same difficulties they do. We go through uh, issues with jobs and we have problems with our kids sometimes and we have um, you know, issues uh, with our health and we, you know, cancer attacks us as well and tra- turmoil and loss and heartbreak and heartache. We face all of those same things and when the world sees us facing those same things, but our response to those things is so drastically different from the rest of the world, that's when they perk up their ears and they go, wait a minute, what is that? What is that? But we're not able to respond in the way that God would have us to, that God desires for us to, if we are not fully abiding in Him. You see, because if I don't believe that Jesus is all I need, then when cancer comes, if I don't believe that Jesus is all I need, then when, when I lose my job, If I don't believe that God has got this when that child is going astray, if my confession is not that God is good when the world around me seems to be falling apart, maybe that's an indication that I am not fully dependent on Him. Obedient to. But when we're able to do that, and and by the way, just so you know, it is not a pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, kind of (laughs) put blinders on and be in denial that there's pain in the world and... uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to offend some of you, uh, but that whole better than I deserve thing, you know, sometimes we just say that, you know, just it, we give those kind of flippant little things like, you know, just it's, it's our kind of rote response. And it's not that there's anything wrong with those kind of things, but sometimes we do that in denial. Like, um, you know, uh, well, I'm not. I, we'll just. We'll. We'll just. That's enough. We'll stop there on that. But, but it's. It's. But God's not calling us to to denial about the things that are happening in the world. It's something much deeper than that. What God wants for us is for us to experience His presence, to know His heart, to be acquainted with Him, and to know that He walks with us in the darkest night of our soul. We look at Jesus, we look to Jesus, and we see God suffering alongside us. And so that is why we are able to say, like Job did, right? Even if he slay me, I will still praise him. We're able to say, like the three Hebrew children in, who were thrown into the fiery furnace right when they stood before the king and they said, Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow. 
Because they knew that there was something greater waiting for them. They knew that even if all the world falls apart, the treasure that I have in Jesus is more than I could ever need. And that's not, some, that's not some pipe dream, guys. It's not some far off thing. Because see, in this, in this life of mutual abiding, when we really learn to rest in Jesus, what that is, is that is our responsibility then is to live in full dependence and full obedience to God. And God in response as He abides in us promised as that promises that He will fully empower and enable us to live the life that He's called us to. We don't have to do this on our own. In fact, if we're doing it on our own, we're doing it wrong. God never intended it to be that way. His desire is that we fully trust in Him. And when we do that, when we're able to to let go and fully trust in Him, we find that He is more than we need, more than we could have ever hoped for, more than we could have ever longed for. And it's not that we don't experience the pain and the heartache of this world. It's that in those moments, the Lord lifts us up. He is our glory and the lifter of our head, is what the Scripture says. And then Jesus goes on to pray, right? In verse number 22, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. And so, if Christ is our glory... And if he has given us his glory, uh, to me that just begs the question, what is this glory that Jesus has given to us? When we think of glory, and here's, here's honestly, this is where our disconnect happens a lot of times in regard to resting in Jesus. When we think of glory, we think of um, you know, the applause of a crowd or, uh, you know, uh, they make a statue in your honor, or, you know, uh, laurel wreaths and parades, you know, whatever. That we think of human glory. We think of, you know, the sports guy, you know, hoisting his trophy over his head. And, and we think of that as that's, that's glory. That is, that is the pinnacle of human achievement. Well, the, the problem with that is that, number one, it's fleeting and temporary. And number two, that's not really at all what Scripture talks about when it talks about glory. And it's not really at all the heart of what we're trying to get to when we are pursuing glory. When we talk about glory, what we really are talking about is significance. In fact, the word glory actually means weight. I mean, you know, it's something that causes you to stop and take notice. It's something that is heavy. You guys remember that? And that's heavy. Right? That, that was a thing when, anyway. Um, he's not heavy. Anyway, um, some of you know. If you don't, well, you're born after me. <laughs> but it's heavy, right? When we, really, when we really talk about glory, when Scripture talks about glory, and really what we are pressing at, what we are pursuing when we pursue this idea of human glory is significance. And Je- so when Jesus says, the glory you have given me I I have given to them. What he is talking about is that he has given to us the same weight and significance that the Father has given to him. It's this idea of authority. It's this idea of weightiness. It's this idea of permanence. It's this idea of transcendence. 
And so what Jesus is saying is that he has given to us something that is eternal. He has given us something that is weightier, heavier, greater than, more significant than what we have thus far experienced in the world or what the world has to offer to us. Bob Santos said in his book, Glory to Glory, human glory is fickle and subject to forces beyond our control. Earthly glory and the determination of whether a person turns out to be a champion or a loser can depend on nothing more than where a ball happens to hit on a line or the imperfect judgment of a tired referee. Furthermore, the higher we climb on the ladder of independent human glory, the more of our souls we leave in the dirt. Let me read that again. The higher we climb on the ladder of independent human glory, the more of our souls we leave in the dirt. The brilliant lights of fame might shine above our names, but they can do nothing to satisfy the dark emptiness that emerges when the applause fades and our surroundings grow silent. You see, there's this thing inside of us that clamors for significance. There's this thing inside of us that yearns for glory. And we mistakenly allow that glory to terminate on us. We mistakenly, in our fallenness, think that that's about us. But what it's really about, and what we find is that if we put glory in its proper place, if we let glory terminate on the Lord, then we find greater significance and fulfillment and joy and weightiness than we ever, ever could, searching after it in the temporary and and transient and passing places that we tend to look on our own. I love the phrase that Bob used there when he said independent human glory. Because you see, the glory that Jesus gives us, the glory that Jesus calls us into, is anything but independent. In fact, if you look at the life of Jesus himself, the the glory of Jesus was that he lived in full submission and obedience to the will of the Father. In fact, the Word of God says that Jesus never did anything that the Father did not tell him to do. Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus willingly submitted himself to death, even death on a cross. And then, then the Apostle Paul says this, Therefore, right, Because of this, because Jesus willingly submitted himself to die on the cross, therefore, God has given him a name that is higher than any other name. Right? And so if we want to know what it means to live in the glory of God, the way of the cross is the way there. The way of submission, the way of surrender. If we want to walk in unity with God, we must lay aside our agenda and say, God, my life belongs to you. Teach me to abide in you. James chapter 4, verse 10 said it this way. It said, humble yourselves therefore before the Lord and he will exalt you. You see, when we try on our own to achieve significance, we always come up short. That's why, I mean, um, Tom Brady. Right, but that's why Tom Brady, for example, keeps coming back. I wish he would not. Um, That's why he keeps coming back, right? Because five trophies isn't enough. And six trophies isn't enough. And ultimately, what happens, like, right? So eventually, although how he shows no signs of this, I don't understand, but eventually his skills will diminish. 
and the trophies will stop coming. And the danger, right, the danger then, and we've seen it with other great athletes before, and I, I, so the danger is that you, you achieve this level of greatness, and then your skills ultimately begin to fade because you age and injury and all of those kinds of things, and then you retire, and you lose the significance that you once had, and you, you find a guy like a junior Seau who then, right? Because human significance will always leave us empty. Our, there will always be the next thing. And the things of this world are temporary and fleeting, but Christ remains. He never changes. He never is shaken. He never fades. He is always the same. He is always good. He is always loving. He is always faithful. He is always strong. He is always perfect. He is always constant in every way. And so He calls us into this life because He knows That He alone is enough for us. That He alone is able to stand up underneath the weight of life's troubles and turmoils and heartaches and pain. That He alone is able to bear up under the weight of your hopes and your dreams. That He alone is enough to satisfy the deepest longings of our souls. And so when He calls us into this life of mutual indwelling, which calls us into a place of complete dependence and obedience to him when he calls us into that it is not because he somehow needs something from us it's because he desperately wants something for us you see God God doesn't call us to worship him because he needs his ego stroked He doesn't call us to worship. He doesn't call us to give our lives in service to Him because because He needs to be reminded how great He is. In fact, the Scriptures say that God is not served by human hands as if He needed anything. You see, God calls us to that because we need to be reminded how great He is. He calls us into that because He knows that He created us to be complete only in Him. And when we abide in Him and He abides in us, that's when we find our true place in the world. We find ourselves approved of by a God who loves us extravagantly. And we find significance that the applause of the world could never compare to. We're going to have to wrap up real quickly. I know we've got some, some verses yet to go, but I want to give you a few practical takeaways today. If we want to live in unity with God, if we want to live in this place of mutual abiding where we are living in Christ and Christ is living in us, there are just a couple of things. Number one, I would just tell you that this, this idea is it's a reality that's already true inside of you. Right? If you've said, Jesus, I belong to you. In that moment, right, he takes up residence in us. He is dwelling in us, in you right now. But it's much like uh, sanctification, which that's that big, that's a $10 word that just means basically getting more like Jesus, right? That's a process in our lives. Now, the moment that we are saved, we, the moment that we give our lives to Jesus, in the eyes of God, we are made completely righteous, right? He sees us washed and clean. He sees us as 
made righteous because of what Jesus has done. So the, the, the word that the Scripture uses is imputed, right? The righteousness of God, righteousness of Jesus was imputed. That basically means placed upon us, put on us, right? So we were, we were made righteous because of Jesus, not because of what we've done. So in that moment, we are made completely righteous. We are sanctified, right, in the eyes of God. But that also then becomes a process by which we begin to walk that out and live that out so that we might live into the reality of what God has already done. This idea of indwelling, of of resting in Christ, of living a life of full dependence and obedience to Him is much the same. Is it a re, is a reality that God has already made provision for, and it is something that He calls us to walk into. But I want to give you a couple of practical things today that I think will help us in this in this journey toward abiding in Christ. The first is this. Get ready. Prayer. I know, I know, you were waiting for some earth-shattering thing. But here's the problem with prayer. We all know we should do it, but most of us just fail to do it. Can we be honest about that? But man, can I tell you something? Prayer was a significant part of Jesus' life. And so if... If Jesus felt like it was important for him to pray, I probably should feel it's important for me too. In fact, let me tell you a little bit about Jesus' prayer life. Um, Scripture says that Jesus uh, was always praying, right? In Luke chapter 5, verse 16 specifically, it records this. It says, Jesus often withdrew from the crowds to pray. Jesus prayed before meals. Jesus prayed when life was busy. Jesus prayed before miracles. Jesus prayed before choosing his disciples. Jesus prayed early in the morning, and Jesus prayed late at night. Jesus sometimes prayed all night. He prayed before and after great events in his life. He prayed while he was on the cross. And he prays currently and continually on our behalf to the Father. You see, this idea of abiding is really about relationship. And not just a relationship that says, I prayed this prayer once and so that I wouldn't go to hell. I prayed this prayer once so that, you know, we're all good. Right? That's, that's not relationship. And we mistakenly sometimes think that, that that's, that's kind of what the Christian life consists of. I pray this prayer and then I just go to church every week and, That's not at all what Scripture ever holds up to us that God is calling us to. It's relationship. And so if we're going to have relationship with the Lord, we need to be talking with Him. And that's So prayer should be a significant part of our lives because it was a significant part of Jesus' life. In fact, Jesus' prayer life was so remarkable that His disciples, when they they observed Him praying, said, Will you teach us to pray? Right? I mean, these are guys who'd grown up in Jewish families, right? They'd grown up in, in Israel. They, they knew what it was to pray, but Jesus' prayer life was different. So they said, Teach us to pray. So we can ask too, Lord, teach me to pray. Right? The second thing is this uh, so we, we need to be praying and we need to be practicing Sabbath. It's not something we do very well in the modern church especially, and especially here in the United States because we have a, a culture that is um, predicated on do, 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 go, 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 more, more, more. And we fall into the trap of thinking that we have to live in that way. But what Sabbath says is I, I don't need to do anything. Because God is my provider. God is my sustainer. And I will honor him first. And instead of striving, instead of pushing, instead of... I'm going to say this day is sacred and it belongs to you. And I will not... I will trust that tomorrow that thing that needs to be done will still be there or that you will take care of it. 
and I am going to rest in the truth that the world will not stop rotating because, because I am not there to keep it spinning. Right? And, and by the way, I, I want you to know I'm not advocating for some rigid and legalistic observation of Sabbath. I, I, don't, I don't think it has to be on a particular day. I don't think it has to look a certain way. But I do think it's important for us to consider its implications in our lives. The Hebrew word Sabbath literally means stop. Stop. means stop. And so when, this just that, I find it interesting. So the command for Sabbath, and I've, I've got I've to wrap up, I know. But blame it on the water. Um, the command for Sabbath was given to God's people, given to the people of Israel, right after they had been delivered out of slavery in Egypt, and they'd been slaves for 400 years in Egypt. When you are a slave, your entire value is measured on how much you can produce. It's all about output. Can you make more, do more, right? When... When, when you are no longer useful, you are eliminated. And so this has been the entire existence of God's people in Egypt for 400 years. The very first thing that the Lord says to them after he delivers them out of slavery is stop. Stop. It's as if he is saying to them, I love you not because of what you can do for me. And in fact, not only am I giving you the opportunity to stop, not only am I inviting you to rest, I am commanding it to be so. Six days you shall work, and on the seventh day you will rest. See, this is, this is life. This is fresh air to God's people. This is not a, oh, we, we, there's a day of the week that we can't work. That's how we look at it, though, in the modern context. Like, oh, God, Sabbath, what do you mean? I got, I got things to do. It's interesting. Man, all right, I can't do that today. All right, we'll do that some other time. There's a whole, there's a whole thing on Sabbath we could do. But you need it. You see, the, it's interesting because there are, it's in the Ten Commandments, right? The command for Sabbath is one of the top ten. And um, none of the other nine do we say is no longer needs to be observed because Jesus died on the cross. But for some reason we say that about Sabbath. I'll just let you wrestle with that. But it means to stop, to stop trying to do things in our own strength, to acknowledge that God is enough for us. If we want to abide in God, then the practice of Sabbath is literally about that, of stopping and saying, you are enough for me, and I'll set aside this day, this time, these moments for you, because you are enough. I'm just going to be with you. So I would just encourage you to do that. Turn off your phone. Turn off the TV. Do it, you know. Um, like, I, I don't know what it would look like for you, but for me, uh, there, is, there is nothing that says Sabbath more to me than, like, standing in water up to about my thighs with a rod in my hand. And, you know, that, that's beautiful rest to me. There's a picture in, in Scripture um, where Jesus... in His disciples are walking through a field on the Sabbath. And uh, the the disciples are grabbing heads of the grain as they walk by and they're eating them. They're like, you know, snacking on some of the grain as they walk through. And the Pharisees chastise Jesus and his disciples for this because they say that they're working on the Sabbath because they're picking the grain, they're harvesting grain. 
And Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for this. And so again, I want you to understand that I'm not talking about some legalistic and super formal observation of the Sabbath. But I am talking about a rhythm in our lives where which, whereby we take time to rest. We take time to be in the presence of God. God created us for it. He sets that rhythm from the very beginning. Do you think God rested on the seventh day because he needed to? He wasn't tired from all of his creating. His power does, is, is not limited. In fact, the word of God says he never sleeps or slumbers, so it's not like he needed a nap. Right? God rests on the seventh day in Genesis chapter 1 because he is setting up a rhythm for us. He's showing us the way in which we ought to live and the way in which our body operates best and the way in which you know, our, we, we were designed and created to operate. And he sets up this rhythm in our lives that, that gives room for him to be our significance and our source and our strength and our restorer. So we need to be spending time in prayer. We need to make practice of Sabbath. And then the last thing I would say is just times of meditation. We sometimes uh, do pretty well at reading Scripture, right? We do pretty good at, at reading it, right? Just as a matter of, of religious obligation. Like, I'll read my chapters today. And there's nothing wrong with that. There can be some benefit to that. In fact, I encourage you, men, read the Scriptures. But don't just read them. Ponder them, pray through them, write things down, meditate on them, let them fill you. Because that's the way that God has chosen to reveal himself to us. And so if we want to learn to abide in him, the first, place we, the first thing we need to do is to know who he is. So spend time in that place. This is the heart of God for us. This is the prayer that Jesus prays for us. And he prays all of this, right? So that we might experience his glory, so that we might know his goodness. And he ends it, in fact, he ends his prayer, right? If we go all the way back to our text from the very beginning, he says, I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known. Right? So he's going to continue to reveal the Father to us. He's going to continue to reveal who he is to us. That the love with which you have loved me may be in them. You see, that, that's God's heart for you. That's God's heart for me this morning that we experience and know the love that he has for us. And by the way, just a few verses earlier, he says that this is the, that it's the same love with which the Father has loved Jesus. Did you know that? God loves you in the same way that he loves Jesus. That's, that's, in, that's insane. Because you see, Jesus would have been good enough to earn it. I can't ever get close to that. And yet, Father loves us in the same way as he loves the Son. And his heart for us today, his desire for us is that we experience that love, that we live in this place of abiding, that we learn the joy of being in full dependence and obedience to him. Let's pray. God, I love you, and I'm so grateful that you continue to pour out upon us love, unmistakable, undeniable, love beyond measure, that you invite us into this beautiful life of abiding in you and you abiding in us, where we learn to be dependent on you where we learn to be fully obedient and submitted and surrendered and find joy and freedom there, and where you abide in us, where you live in us through your Holy Spirit to empower and enable us to live the life that you've called us to, where you call us into this place of unity with you, of walking in oneness with you. And when we do that, God, we 
find ourselves free. I thank you for that. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would uh, draw us deeper into the heart of who you are. I pray, Lord, that <laughs> you would help us to see that you call us to these things for your, for your glory and for our good, always for our good. And the law of the Lord is perfect, delighting in the soul. So Lord, as we move into these final moments together, we just ask that you would speak to us. We say, God, here we are. Speak to us, God. And let, our, let us respond to the truth of your word in whatever way we need to. If there's something that we need to surrender to you, if there's something that we need to confess, if there's a praise, God, that rises up in our heart, we just give these moments to you and ask that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name. If you could keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed just for a second. I know I've kept us a little long today. Um, but I, I don't want to leave today without giving you an opportunity if you're here and you say, Todd, I'm not following Jesus today. I'm not walking in step with God. And I know that there's something that needs to change. I need to give my life to God today. Today I want to surrender. I want to submit my life to God. The good news for you today is that this mutual abiding that we've been talking about, this resting in Christ begins with a simple step of faith. And all you have to do today is acknowledge that you need Him and just, just say to him, I invite you to make your home in my heart and let him know that you're ready today to respond in dependence and obedience to his will. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that right now. So if that's you and you say, Todd, I want today to be the day that I give my life to God. I want, I need him. If you just raise your hand right where you are, let me see you. I'm not going to call you to the front. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I just want to be able to pray with you today. So if you could raise your hand. I see you back here on my right. Thank you. Up in the balcony, I see you. Thank you. Over here on my left, thank you. I see your hand. Again, over here on my right, thank you. I see you. Amen. So here's what I'd like us to do. I'd like... If you raise your hand to pray along with me, and I want to invite everyone in the room to pray along with them uh, this simple prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for making a way so that I could be in relationship with you. I invite you in today take residence in my heart. And from today forward, my life belongs to you. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Make me yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Can I tell you today that if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I am so proud of you. And I want to ask you to do me a favor. There's a, a card in the seat back in front of you. If you could take one of those and fill it out and just drop it in the box on your way out today. There's boxes next to the doors on your way out. We want to be able to walk alongside you as you start your journey of faith. And we want to be able to help you learn what it means to, to be a follower of Jesus and to experience the life that God has intended for us to. And so I want to, uh, we would love, and it would be our, our honor and our privilege to be a part of that. So if you could do that for me, I would certainly appreciate it. And then the, here's what's going to happen now. As is our practice, we're going to sing one more song together. 
Uh, this is a time for us to respond to the word that God has spoken to us. And as I was, uh, as I said earlier, maybe there's something that you need to confess or something that uh, you need to, to give to the Lord, or maybe there's just a, a song of praise that's rising in your heart. Just whatever God has spoken to you today, let's take this time to respond to him. God bless you. I love you. Have a great day.